again because this changes as we go from session to session just a little bit of demographical information so first of all we're interested to know um, where which country you're in um, so I'm about to open that and we've watched this change as, as we follow the Sun go around the planet so please let us know where you are Give it um, a few seconds more for people to get in. It's a nice lot of answers. Good, thank you. Oh, they're still coming in. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it there. The next one, we're interested in what do you do? so what is your main occupation or role um, and if you're going to give others it be uh, can be quite entertaining to see what other means for you so I'll give you an example Oh, I'm the only other. That's all right. That was simple. Oh no, uh, have a new gun. Still, some people going in. Oh, here's another other, just to keep me company. Oh, well, the majority of students. Yep. Okay, thank you for that. And last of all. We're interested in where you're connecting from, uh, by which we mean um, what sort of organisation location as opposed to your country. Uh, so just bear with me while I clear the answers from last time. I have got a bit of a spread this time. Yes, we've had several well, sessions I... where it's 100% home, isn't it? Yes, the <laughs> Yale School of Nursing is gaining exclamation marks, I think. I think it only had three. Well, I wonder why that sure. might be. We might find out in a minute why that might be, mightn't we? <laughs> There's a surprise. Okay, uh, looks like we're about there. It's great okay. to see you. Oh, no, still a couple more. <laughs> right, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your patience, everybody. Um, uh, back to you, Linda. Okay, thank you very much then. It gives me very great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Holly Kennedy, who is Professor of Midwifery at Yale in Connecticut in the USA. She's an internationally known midwife researcher and past president of the American College of Nurse Midwives. She is particularly interested in linking practice to outcomes, barriers to evidence-based practice, and shared decision-making. And she's speaking today about promoting healthy physiologic birth in the United States. So over to you, Holly, and thank you very much. All right, thank you, Linda. Uh, so welcome to everybody. I, I see some of my students on and some old friends. Sheila down there in Cape Town, and uh, so I'm glad you're joining us uh, today. So um, I um, often do a, a, a a talk for my students that's about physiologic birth, but I'm changing a little bit um, for this talk to, to talk about what we're trying to do in the United States and not only in promoting healthy physiologic birth, but also uh, what we're doing as uh, professional midwifery organizations uh, and a little bit about the journey that we've taken in that. So um, first of all, I just want to look at the objectives. We're going to look at the work that the American College of Nurse Midwives, MANA, which is the Midwives Alliance of North America, and NACPM, which is the North American, uh, North, the, uh, the National Association of Certified Professional Midwives. 
Um, we developed a consensus statement on normal physiologic birth a few years ago, and I'm going to go through that and the process that we did and the recommendations, and then take you down the journey from where we've gone since then. Um, so when we took this on, I became uh, uh, president-elect of the American College of Nurse Midwives in 2009, and then became president in 2010. And um, I, I took on as one of my initiatives to, to really um, take our organization uh, further in promoting uh, physiologic birth, healthy birth, um, as something that we were experts at and um, that I wanted us to be known for. And we looked at um, other normal birth statements around the world and really felt, one, we had, did not have a document, but we also felt that some of the documents that we had seen were lacking. The other, at the same time, uh, in the context of U.S. midwifery, uh, we had a bit of a, uh, I guess disconnect is one word, but we had several factions of midwives that were not particularly getting along well together. And um, I felt that it was divisive and really felt that we needed to um, begin to work together on a very different level. So I invited the Midwives Alliance of North America and the National Association of Certified Professional Midwives uh, to join us. To give you a little bit of feedback or a little bit of background for those of you that aren't, um, don't know about US midwifery, we basically have several routes to midwifery. Uh, we have um, through nursing, and I would say probably the majority of the midwives in our country are what we would call nurse midwives, and they're educated both in the discipline of nursing and midwifery. And then we have certified midwives who um, also come through ACNM routes, uh, and they uh, are more direct entry midwives and um, don't come through nursing, but they take the same certification exam that certified nurse midwives do. And then we have uh, certified professional midwives who um, are um, focused primarily on home birth and uh, are, take a national certification um, uh, for, for their um, profession. So, um, so what I did was we invited um, members from the three organizations together as what we believed were the experts in normal birth. And we developed a task force, so we had 21 individuals from the U.S. midwifery organizations and then people that came from other childbirth advocacy and consumer groups um, to reach a consensus um, statement on a definition for normal birth and the practices that best support its achievements. Our goal was to, um, uh, to really have a statement that was uh, grounded not only from the work of, of all of us together, but also from the evidence. So um, uh, we also wanted to identify measurable benchmarks to describe the optimal processes and outcomes reflective of normal physiologic birth. Um, we wanted to look at what factors facilitate or disrupt normal physiologic birth based on the evidence, and then to create a template for system changes through clinical practice, education, research, and health policy, and ultimately improve the health of mothers and infants while avoiding unnecessarily, unnecessary and costly interventions. So that was our goal. It took us two years. Uh, and this is what we found. We had four key themes that provided the framework for the document, so we had uh, the definitions of normal physiologic birth. Oh, wait, I'm going to go back here for a minute because I think some of my slides. So for some reason, these slides aren't showing up. So I had two slides that explained our method. Uh, we used uh, the Delphi method, which is a research uh, approach that brings together a group of experts um, in in a in an anonymous way of working together. Um, the Delphi method was actually developed by the Department of Defense 
who to bring experts together, but that would have different power bases. So you might have a general that would outweigh just because the person's a general compared to maybe an engineer that was maybe of much lower rank. And so that was developed to work on very difficult problems. And so um, the first thing that we did an anonymous survey with the 21 stakeholders to ask them to identify what they thought were important factors around normal birth. And we, we gave them a, a certain set of questions, and then they um, just wrote in. And um, then we used a qualitative method to analyze those and to start to parse out what we were seeing. And then we brought those back as statements to the entire group. And then the whole group, anonymously, ranked those as to how important they felt those were on a ranking of 1 to 7, that that, that, that statement should be in a consensus statement about normal birth. Uh, it took us nine rounds to get to the final uh, agreed upon statement. And then we took that statement back to our three organizations, to our boards of directors who had to then approve it. Um, so, so the areas that we saw were definitions of normal physiologic birth, the mechanisms and outcomes of normal physiologic birth, factors that influence it, and recommendations for increasing it. Uh, so these are the three organizations, ACNM, MANA, and NACPM. And this is the document itself. And um, I'm going to highlight this word normal because we spent a lot of time uh, talking about this. We took our preliminary findings on the road at our and at our national conferences and also at CM 20, I believe it was 2011, and presented it and then got feedback from um, uh, people in the audience. Um, the word normal was uh, somewhat uh, divisive for some folks because if it, it people felt if uh, if you weren't normal then you were abnormal and that didn't seem very right um, and so we actually finalized the statement without the word normal in it and we had, it was supporting healthy and physiologic childbirth um, and in the very last days of the um, analysis, we actually brought the word back in because we felt that it was an important adjective to talking about the physiology of childbirth. So it wasn't that childbirth itself was normal or abnormal, but it was about supporting the normal physiology. So we did keep it in the end. Um, this is where you can get it. If you go on to, to acnm.org, come over to Professional Resources, and the statement is right there. It's also, uh, if you um, put my name into PubMed uh, and put normal physiologic childbirth, it will come up in an article that we, did, that we wrote about the actual process. So, the first area of the, the statement is about defining the normal physiology of uh, childbirth. Um, and I, I just see, oh, Kim, thank you for, for um, clarifying that. You're right, many CPMs do attend birth in birth centers. Um, so the normal physiology is characterized by spontaneous, spontaneous onset and progression, includes biological and psychological conditions that promote effective labor, results in the vaginal birth of the infant and placenta, results in physiologic blood loss, um, facilitates optimal newborn transition through skin to skin and keeping the mother and infant together, and supports initial initiation of breastfeeding. The fact we looked at the factors that we thought influenced normal physiologic childbirth, and when you go to the article the statement itself, each one of these areas is cited in terms of the evidence for, for these statements. So for the woman, her own individual health status and physical fitness, fitness autonomy and self-determination in childbirth, her personal knowledge and confidence about birth, including cultural beliefs, norms, practices, and education about the value of physiologic birth, fully informed shared decision-making, 
and access to healthcare systems, settings, and providers supportive of and skilled in normal physiologic birth. You can have all of these things, but if she's in a healthcare system that is not supportive, then it's very hard um, to achieve it. For the clinician, it was very important that clinicians are educated, knowledgeable, competent, and skilled and confident in supporting um, birth, including helping, helping women cope with pain. There's a commitment to working with women through education to enhance their confidence and diminish their fear, commitment to shared decision making, and again, working within an infrastructure supportive of normal physiologic birth. For the birth setting and the environment, we believed it was important that every woman has access to midwifery care, that there's adequate time for shared decision making with freedom from coercion, no inductions or augmentations without an evidence-based clinical indication, encouragement of nourishment as the woman desires, and freedom of movement. Intermittent auscultation, unless otherwise indicated, Maternity care providers skilled in non-pharmacologic methods, care that supports each woman's comfort, dignity, and privacy, and respect for each woman's cultural needs. Now, I want to just uh, highlight that it is a continuum. And I think some of you may know that I had the, um, the pleasure of spending a, a year in, in England studying their work on normal birth. And the, some of the takeaways I took from that experience was this commitment that, that all women need a midwife and some women need an obstetrician too, and that normalcy, normality, is a continuum. And so that even though a woman might develop some aspects in, in, her, in her health that might become less normal, that there were still many things that we can do to support normalcy and, and to support a woman's normal physiology, um, and that uh, it takes real skill to do that. So these were the recommendations that we made at the end of the document for policy, education, and research. So that policies were introduced into hospital settings to support normal physiologic birth. So if, if intermittent auscultation was not an expectation for low-risk women, how, how could you get that set into a policy. Um, a real comprehensive examination and dissemination of evidence and care practices supportive of normal physiologic birth. And I'm going to be talking about that in a minute. And midwifery care as a key strategy to support normal physiologic birth. Increasing the midwife workforce and enhancing regulations and funding strategies to support their practice competency-based interdisciplinary education for maternity health care clinicians and students on the application of care that promotes normal birth. So if you're a, a physician or a midwife student and you've never really seen uh, physiologic birth, then how would you expect to know what it is? So really very much trying to develop the competencies in supporting women in, in birth. Um, and then development of a future research agenda on short and long-term effects of normal physiologic birth. And I'm just going to digress for a minute on this, is that I think most of you are familiar with the Lancet series on midwifery that came out last summer. Well, there, uh, I'm working with my colleagues on that series on, a, on a, an additional paper um, that will be um, setting a research agenda for future midwifery research. And this is clearly one of the issues that will be ranked um, on, that, on the agenda. We're just getting ready to launch that to about a thousand different people around the world to have them rank it. So what we've done, so we, we published that um, uh, paper in 2011 and then developed and an ongoing task force at the American College of Nurse Midwives and have launched now what we're calling a Healthy Birth Initiative. Um, and these are some of the, uh, these are all downloadable to, for anybody who wants to go on and, and uh, see them and use them. Um, um, and this is what it looks like. So if you go to uh, the professional resources area that I showed you earlier, you go to this Healthy Birth Initiative. 
So what we have on this is we have a number of tools. So for women, we have a normal, healthy childbirth for women and families, what you need to know in English and Spanish. For maternity providers, we have a, a toolkit called Birth Tools. And that has a compendium of um, evidence that promotes uh, physiologic birth and various aspects that you can use in your, um, in your birth setting. And then we have a, a document for hospital policymakers, payers, and other organizations called Birth Matters. And that one is actually available for purchase. Um, so I would encourage you to go on and explore our website and um, uh, see all the different things that we have. So the, I want to end with um, uh, <clears throat> what the other outcome was. So um, in the two years that it took us with MANA and ACPM and the ACM working together, we began to trust each other, I think, in a very different way and to work um, together in a different way. In 2011, we came back from Durban, South Africa, uh, from the ICM Congress, and um, where the ICM passed their global standards for education, uh, regulation, and association. And I called the, the seven midwifery, so we have the, the three organizations that I've been talking about are professional organizations. We also have two certifying agencies for uh, that manage the certification examination for certified nurse midwives and certified midwives. That is um, ACME. And then MEEK cert uh, manages the certification for the certified professional midwives. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It's AMCB for the uh, nurse midwives and certified midwives, and NARM, which is the North American Registry of Midwives for CPM. And we also have two accrediting agencies who accredit the education, um, and that's ACME and uh, MEEK. So that's seven organizations. So we, we brought those organizations together um, three years ago for our first meeting. Uh, we had five representatives from each organization. And we began to talk about the issues of midwifery in the United States and how we could bring ourselves together so that we would have a collective voice. Um, and we've had facilitated meetings. We just had our third one um, last weekend. And have I'm just, um, I think all of us have felt like it is a historic moment in the United States of the, the work that we are doing together. So I think I'm going to end it on that and open it up to your questions. Thank you very, so, very much. Um, Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Heidi wanted to, to actually speak, I think, so if she still would like to speak, um, rather than us answer it via the chat box, please put your hand up again. But otherwise, you might see in the chat box some of the comments that have been made so far. Holly? Yes, I'm see I'm so, so I'm going through them. So, uh, so I'm not sure what Sherry is screaming about, but uh, uh, but I, I, if she wants to tell us, I, that would be great. And I thank you. I, it's lovely to see all these my friends on this on this call. Um, so Heidi said, "Sad to see OB nurses who don't have experience with normal birth." You know that is so institution specific. You know I've I've had the fortune the good fortune to work at various institutions. And I can tell you I've been in some hospitals where the obstetrical nurses are just fabulous and they do support normal birth. Um, and, and I've been in others where they, it's, it's been less that way because the norm has just been everybody's on monitoring and et cetera. But I believe that, um, it, at least in the United States, the, the first critical mass to support to convince about the importance of normal birth, of, of the supporting the physiology of your body for normal birth, and why that has good outcomes for both the mother and the baby, are women. Women want to do the right thing for their, their baby. So really working with them to help them understand that, and then working with their wherever they're going to be giving birth um, to help that happen. This In our country, the second critical mass are nurses, because 
in all hospitals there are obstetrical nurses. And if we can get obstetrical nurses to, um, we don't have the we don't have the power the the people power to have a midwife for every woman at this point. Hopefully someday we will. But um, so anyway, that's the case on the obstetrical nurses. Oh, thank you, Kim, for doing the the link. I tried to do that on my PowerPoint and I couldn't get it to work. Um, Sheila's saying she wants to endorse that every woman needs a midwife. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, I um, I was in some of the high risk um, cases that I observed when I was in the UK. I was so impressed with the midwifery care in in those cases. So even though a woman was having an obstetrician manage her as she was critically ill with something, the midwife was there working with her and helping her on on all the other aspects. Other questions? I think perhaps they're being typed into the chat box more than anything else. <clears throat> Excuse my frog in my throat. Does anybody wish to ask verbally a question or make a comment? There's a comment there from Sue. Right, so 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 it in the U.S. it is um, and my U.S. colleagues feel free to jump in if you want. Um, around the turn of the uh, century, around around 1900, the last century, uh, midwives were pretty well eliminated by medicine, and uh, and partly that's because we were a nation of immigrants. And the uh, midwives were not organized, um, so they came from different countries, they spoke different languages, and they, they simply weren't organized. And so it was relatively easy to get rid of them. And then uh, around 1920, we started to see uh, some uh, organized efforts to bring them back, but it's, it's been a long, hard slog to, to, uh, to get them. We, we attend just under 10% of births in the United States, um, and, um, and it's just that medicine has a much stronger hold here. But this is the good, I think the good news, um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists told us last weekend that they really are looking to midwifery as to be a solution for the future because they do not have enough um, residents coming into obstetrics, um, and they are predicting, and the change of mix has, um, there are many, many more women now than men in, obst in, in obstetrics, and they have a different um, uh, work pattern. So they, you know, they come out of school, they um, finish their residency, they tend to have a baby, and then they tend to want to work part time. So they're predicting by 2020 to be 8,000 obstetricians short. So we have to do our work to, to begin educating more midwives. So Carleen, um, I, I would, the, that's a great question about what what really drives changes. And I would say uh, in large developed countries or other countries. So the the third article in the Lancet series for midwifery um, is an ex to me it's an exceptionally interesting article. They looked at um, the countries that had the the steepest drop in maternal mortality, and then they compared those to the countries who had uh, an increase in midwives uh, and, and in midwifery care, and then they looked at the various factions um, that in, in the country uh, to see if they could understand what, what, what were the drivers, what, what was driving change. And it was different, but it, a lot of it had to do with political will. Uh, a recognition that there was a problem and that they needed to um, um, 
uh, increased midwifery. And if you look at the, there's a, they have some very good bar graphs, and they show um, uh, the increase in the midwifery workforce and the increase in the healthcare infrastructure is a really important one. Um, so, um, and though that that particular paper was focused more on low and middle income countries. I think in the United States, the drivers are in, in high income, higher developed countries. The drivers are a lot about healthcare economics. So. Other thoughts? Deb Walker, are you still on? Because I know you've, you've um, had some interest in this in terms of the US as well. Yes, she's still here somewhere. <laughs> the other thing in the in the United States that drives education is um, it costs it's very expensive to educate midwives and there's very little government um, funding for it whereas uh, in medicine, there's a lot of, of government funding um, for medicine. So I have some work to do on that. So it looks like Carlene's typing. Oh, good. I'm like glad you like them, Kim. So, so many of the NGO funding for global health is focusing on community workers and birth attendants, not on midwives. Sadly, I would agree, Carlene, and that was one of the the um, drivers for doing that Lancet series on midwifery to to really be able to show that when you look at how we define mid, um, midwifery, and we really talked about midwifery more than midwives, is that uh, it is about what we do. And um, at the end of the day, midwives do that best. But um, it, is, it is a reality that many countries are focusing on community workers. And, and um, we really need to be working across those countries to, to try to get them to focus on midwifery and, and educating midwives. Yes, uh, Catherine, I would agree. Um, the, Amer the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists last month um, officially, um, I don't, what was the word they used? Not adopt, but um, they endorsed the ICM global standards. So that was a huge thing for them to do. One of the things, um, for those of you that aren't from the United States, we have 50 states and we have 50 different kinds of regulations for midwives. So certified nurse midwives are, are um, licensed in all 50 states, but certified midwives and certified professional midwives are not. Certified professional midwives, I think, are in 29 now. Um, so one of our goals is to get common language that legislators in all those 50 states can understand and uh, agreement on that. So we've been working on a, using the Delphi method um, to achieve, to develop a consensus statement on principles for model legislation. And that's, and we've done that with the seven organizations. So that's another example of, of how 
you start with something small and how, how you get to it. Um, uh, so Melissa, that's, that is what we're trying to do. Um, uh, I do get the feeling that throughout the world we're kind of um, on, a, on, a, on a road back upwards. You know how for probably 10, 15, 20 years ago we were all worried that midwifery everywhere was going to disappear a death. Uh, we're quite lucky in the UK with our midwifery. Um, but even here we were worried about it and we were beginning to talk about obstetric nurses instead. And we were saying at that point, we're on the cusp, we're on the cusp. And I do feel myself that there's definitely, we have got an upward um, slant going now and that we need to just keep gathering speed and we'll get this sorted. Do you agree? I, d I do. I totally agree. We need to be out there really working with women on this, you know. Um, you know, women have driven change uh, in, in maternity care. I mean, since Queen Victoria received ether, you know, the, and then all women wanted it. Um, so if, if we can help women understand that uh, spontaneous labor is healthy, it's healthier for her baby, um, rather than doing an, an elective induction, uh, why vaginal birth? is good for her baby um, because most mothers want the right thing for their babies um, and that means really knowing what they're reading knowing what they're watching um, because there's a lot of terrible childbirth education books out there and a lot of terrible baby channels on television we have them too but of course we have a royal baby a new royal baby here today yeah. uh, a little a little princess and it is rumored, I don't know if we will ever discover if this is true, but it is rumored that Kate Middleton, Catherine, sorry, um, has been pursuing a nice, normal, natural birth and has been um, looking towards midwifery care. But I don't suppose we'll ever discover um, whether that's true or not. So maybe those rumors will add a little bit to the flame of normality. Yeah. Right. Right, maybe we can get her to be the whatever you call it, that Princess Anne is now to the Royal College of Midwives. Patron? Oh, did, oh, Catherine, uh, did that, so the bill passed in Maryland, uh, yes, we knew about that, um, so this was, a, this was a really good bill, and this was also an example of midwives and obstetricians working very well together. You'd expect her to have a three-hour labor, Melissa, seeing she, um, it's not that long since she had the last one, and that wasn't very long either, I don't think. So I guess <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it, Chris? I'll trust you to come up with that one. Um, yeah. Good-sized baby, too. Yeah, smaller than the last one, though. I'm sure they said it was a little bit smaller. Not that that's got anything to do with anything. Eight three. <laughs> Facebook is covered with pictures of this new baby. Really? Yep. Huh? They even had an extended news bulletin. You probably had those in them um, in the USA as well. But had an extended news bulletin that went on for about an hour and a half while they were waiting for her to come out of hospital because it was we were told that she was coming out early. <laughs> and um, she was delayed and they eventually had to kind of move on to the next item, I believe. I got fed up watching it anyway. Oh, it's just a royal baby, you know. <laughs> yes, I agree, Chris. No election. I haven't heard anything about the election all day. Wow. Fabulous. Um, anyway, have you got any more pertinent questions other than about Catherine Middleton? <laughs> Sorry? No, no, I'm, I'm just laughing at all, at, um, all these comments. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm trying to bring them back on track. We've got, we've time for another couple of minutes of discussion. Um, we have the midwives for all coming next. Holly, and they're talking about the Lancet series of midwifery as well. Oh, okay. Is that Petra? Yep, she's here in the box. Petra and John are here for doing the next session, the final session. Oh, okay, great.
there's some great initiatives going on in the world at the moment. So what's the percent of home births in New Zealand? Thank you, Sarah. Eight percent, that's quite good. Wow. What is it here, about two percent or something, if we're lucky? Alison mm -hmm. Ewing, do you know? Independent midwife? Yeah, we're we're under we're one point five. There's a private message for you from Kim Lane in the um, chat box down the bottom. If you have time to kind of do, <laughs> Alison uh, says I in a lovely Scottish accent. It's only two percent. <laughs> Well, I think we seem really to be um, moving away from the topic, or rather losing um, things to discuss. Uh, so if anybody's got any more um, questions specific to Holly, rather than a bit of chatting, can you put them up right now? And then we'll be able to um, move on. Hi, Linda, can you hear me? True, Yes, I can. Um, I just had a quick look for the home birth stats for New Zealand, and it hovers at about 4.9%. Um, but in some areas where um, there is a very strong home birth association and uh, home birth midwives, it's as high as 12.5%. Oh. Good. Thank you. Okay, I think everybody seems to be winding up a little bit, so it just um, falls to me then to say thank you very much, um, Holly, for coming on and discussing this um, topic, which is very uh, important for women everywhere, really. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you. I'll just go through a final few um, slides in a moment. Is there anything final you wish to say, Holly? No, thank you uh, for inviting me. and. Um, Petra, I wish I could stay on for the next one, but I have to run to another meeting. Um, and uh, all of you, to if you have any questions, to um, you know, get in touch with me. It's it's, it's holly.kennedy at yale.edu. I'll type it in here. Well, that's an easy one to remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, to, to to reassure you, you, you will be able to probably by tomorrow, knowing how efficient Annette is to go on tomorrow or the next day onto the website and find the recording of the next session and all the other sessions as well. So oh, thank you great. very much for your interesting um, presentation. Um, right. I'll just quickly go through our last few slides. So to remember to turn off record, which I will do just now. <laughs>